The absence of a father and the lack of a stable family are far too often at the root of an otherwise good kid ending up off track and headed toward an unfulfilled future. Fathers and Families of San Joaquin in Stockton is an agency that stands in the breach and works to build families and father relationships that give kids the support that they need to live happy lives with futures filled with promise. In partnership with the Great Valley Chapter of the American Leadership Forum, Samuel Nunez and Raymond Aguilar join us to share the stories of lives reclaimed and what still needs to be done to ensure that every child has a chance. Next on Studio Sacramento. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. What does Fathers and Families do? So Fathers and Families of San Joaquin's mission is to promote the social, cultural, spiritual, and economic renewal of the most vulnerable families of stock in the greater San Joaquin Valley. As the founder of the organization, I started it about 14 years ago or so, uh, because prior to that, um, as a young man, uh, by the time I was 18 years old, um, actually, you know, I, you don't forget, the, you know, when you have your child and, and you know, I, I was 18 years old, January 2nd, 1993, I became a father. It, the most important role uh, any man will ever uh, take on, right? And um, uh, prior to this, not having a relationship with my own father and really seeing an absence of fathers in my own community, literally almost disappearing overnight, I sought out help to try to help me uh, equip me, fashion me with the skills and tools I needed uh, to be effective in my father. I, uh, effective as a father, I, like many young men that grew up in the communities that I did, in the neighborhood, in the projects, in the hood, um, uh, arguably uh, most of the folks uh, that I grew up with always said, when I become a father, I will never do this, I will never do that. Um, Was that usually true? Unfortunately, we tend to repeat generational cycles until somebody heals in a family. And when somebody heals in a family, then you start seeing the family heal. And once a family starts healing, then you start seeing the community heal. Um, but there was, a, there was an absence of, uh, of real uh, you know, services and opportunities for fathers, frankly, and I, I didn't find any uh, around. Um, so I had my daughter January 2nd, 1993. By February 13th, um, roughly a month later, um, walking in my own neighborhood the day before Valentine's Day, I was confronted by another angry young man in my neighborhood who was carrying a 12-gauge shotgun. Uh, he shot me with the 12-gauge. The bullet penetrated my right side of my chest, exited out my back, uh, shattered my collarbone, punctured my lung, severed the nerves into my arm. Um, I lost double my body weight in blood. Uh, I flatlined four times. Um, and so here I was, right? The last thing I said before... I became unconscious to those that were scrambling around me as I was uh, going in and out of consciousness already was take care of my daughter, uh, take care of my little girl. Um, and so it was a long, hard, uh, you know, recovery, a uh, journey to recovery. And it's never ending. It's still on to this day. When you have trauma at that level as a young person or as any, anybody, it stays with you. The residual impact of that. Um, is always going to be uh, with me. Um, and so um, we started this organization with that in mind, that we didn't have a kid problem in our society. We had a dad problem. Where were the dads at? Where that's were the men at? That's an interesting way to frame it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I mean, the, the facts speak for themselves, right? The, the data tells the story in terms of the likelihood of uh, ending up incarcerated, dropping out of school, um, and other really um, kind of negative outcomes, unhealthy outcomes for children and families. Um, and, and little did I know then, though, that there was more to the story. It wasn't just about a decision that somebody made. As, as I mentioned before, many of my, my, uh, many of my peers growing up always said they wanted to be good fathers. Um, although there was a lack of resources in our community, there was huge investments in other things that really, like I think, perpetuated. Um, I saw 
seemingly overnight, but it took some years, um, the devastation of the war on drugs in our neighborhood. Growing up in the projects, in a campesino family, in a uh, very abstractly poor neighborhood that was disinvested in and abandoned, frankly. Um, there was a lot of policing in our community, and there was a lot of just about everyone I knew, their fathers were incarcerated. Um, and as a result of that, it, it rendered the young people uh, defenseless, right? And so these young people start to organize themselves, albeit in misguided ways, right? Because you don't have the protection By of organizing yourself, you're just talking about like gangs and things like gangs that. Gangs and any way to just really like um, try to defend yourself because you felt under perpetual attack as a young person, as a young uh, Chicano, uh, male, living in a predominantly black and brown community, I felt, I felt vulnerable. I felt defenseless. Um, and then what's more, going to schools where you uh, rub shoulders with more affluent students and, um, you know, went to their homes and saw how different it was there and like, um, and the kind of dichotomy that exists, right, where you're like, they do the same things here that we do in our neighborhood, except they don't get policed. Did you ever ask, why are things this way? Always. I've always been an, a curious person. I've always inquired about that, but there was uh, uh, not many answers. Many questions, but not many answers. And so when we first started the agency, um, it was interesting to see that it was mostly young people, young men, the same young men that I, I was. I saw a, 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 a mirror reflection of who I was as a young man, angry, confused, um, feeling neglected, feeling abandoned, and, and really hating their fathers almost, right? But as much as they hated them, um, that was how much they really wanted them in their life, right? That they wanted to understand what does a father look like and walk like and talk like and where's my father at? So we actually engaged these young people that gravitated towards our, 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 our agency because of the name Fathers and Families um, and their hunger for a father in their life. And, and what we noticed was that there was, there, was, there was more to the story. It wasn't just an individual kind of decision that was made, but there was a series of things that had occurred that really made it very difficult for fathers to show up. And let's get into that for sure. a second. But Raymond, I want to hear your story. How did you come to this work that you're doing right now? So I was one of those kids that I wish that someone would have claimed me. Mm. Uh, I grew up in a lot of uh, situations where I was, I've always thought that I was abandoned. Uh, I was in and out of uh, foster care, shelter homes. Uh, my mother and father were both uh, uh, victims of the heroin epidemic. Uh, by the age of eight, six years old, I was already uh, a ward of the state. Uh, they took me from the custody of my parents and were supposed to protect me and keep me in a safe place. But the system, what they did instead was put me in a place that created more trauma. And, and I had to grow up with this trauma and question, as I said, like Sammy said. What do you mean trauma? Trauma in the fact that Okay, they're supposed to take you from a home and protect you, right? That's what the system was supposed to do. Take you from a place that is unsafe and protect you and keep you safe. So they take me from a drug-infested home where there was drugs and gangs and the likes, the criminal lifestyle. They put me inside uh, 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 the shelter home in Stockton, and uh, what happens there is abuse. I'm now, uh, uh, at, then, at that time at home, I wasn't suffering physical abuse. I was suffering mental and emotional abuse. I then come to these homes and I become physically abused, mm -hmm. uh, psychologically abused, verbal abuse. Anytime so, sexual yeah. abuse happens. So, and well. a lot of times sexual, but there's many yeah. kids in there that suffer even today to the point to where that system is under investigation in Stockton. Uh, so I grew up that way. And by the time I was 15 years old, I was already involved in, in crime running the streets, uh, being an abandoned child. Uh, by the time I was 16 years old, I had caught a case. Uh, to be frank, it was a second degree murder case. Something that- What happened? What happened was, as I said, my family was involved in this lifestyle of criminality. Uh, my mother and father was involved in things that my grandma put out there to survive. She was selling drugs to survive and to maintain the household. And we looked at that as not something bad, but something my grandma was taking care of the household. Uh, one day, two individuals, older males, 138, 142, they decided to rob my grandmother. Uh, at the time, I had just came home from school. I was a freshman in Franklin High School. I uh, had less than a fifth grade comprehension level because I never really went to school. Uh, on probation, got home, my grandma told me what had happened. Uh, went around the corner, and the individuals who had robbed her were right there in the store, in the corner of Pilgrim and Market, shooting drugs, and I confronted them. It got ugly. And I ended up taking the law into my own hands and I shot and killed this man. Now, mm. that was something I had to live with till this day. 
okay? I spent the past 25 years in the penitentiary. From 1991 to 2016, I was in, in prison. Level four prison yards, not no level three, not a level two, not getting rehabilitation services. Yeah. Uh, I was in Pelican Bay, I was in Calipat, I was in Tehachapi, I had all the shoes, the Corcoran, all the level four secured housing, secured unit. housing units for, for gang members and criminals where they felt that there was no more hope. When in reality, I was suffering with a lot of trauma, a lot of abandonment issues because of how my city let me down. No one claimed me. I was that, mm. that kid in the gutter. I was that kid that was abandoned that, that no one wanted to take care of. And today, in, in Stockton, in San Joaquin County, that's happening today still. So I say no kid should be left unattended. No kid should have, a, 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 every kid should have an opportunity to education. Now you work at the center right now, what do you do? So what I do coming home, I never thought that anybody would give me a chance or an opportunity to have a job. So I come over to Fathers and Families of San Joaquin where my parole officer sent me to and I met Sammy Nunez. And this man gave me a chance. He gave me an opportunity to reclaim my hood. To, to take back what was taken from me. And so now what I do is I have the unique opportunity to where I'm able to go back into the schools and teach these schools uh, uh, things that I have learned throughout my incarceration. Also with fathers and families, they gave me tools to learn how to run a restorative circle. Other, other alternatives than to incarcerate, other alternatives than to punish. Mm. So we incorporate our indigenous teachings that our indigenous peoples have left us behind. We create circles, circles that our people have, healing circles. How old are you now? I am 42 years old. Can you still reach these kids? I reach these kids because I still relate to them. I'm still this 16 year old kid. I, I'm 42 years old, but I'm still 16. When they took me from my neighborhood and, and locked me up and incarcerated me and told me I was no good and I was gonna be a, a criminal for the rest of my life, I had to show them that I wasn't gonna be that. Mm. So I came home, like the, like the program says, to reclaim our hood somebody that was from the hood to reclaim the hood to teach our kids a better way. So I, I go there and I tell the kids my story. And I say, man, I feel you, I love you, I care for you. Right. I understand your pain, I understand your suffering mm -hmm. because I've been there and I still suffer sometimes. So I love them kids and I, I try to get them to understand that the decisions you make today will affect the rest of your life. In, since you've been out and you've been doing this work, any kids that you've talked to that stand out in terms of like what you said really made a difference for mm -hmm. them in that moment? I remember when I was a kid and I was always at the back of the seat of the classroom because the teacher wanted me to sit next to her because I was that kid that couldn't listen, that couldn't learn, and it had just so much trauma going on in my life that I was that kid at the back seat and just didn't feel like I, I was a part of something. So I encountered a lot of those kids today and I see them and I say, you know what? I know what you're going through. I understand your pain, I understand your trauma. Mm. I was in a situation where one of the kids was in the classroom and I was speaking and he was falling asleep. And one of the uh, people who worked there went and grabbed the kid from the hood and said, hey, wake up, we're gonna be in detention. And I said, hold on, we don't know what that kid is going through. Maybe he didn't get no sleep last night. Mm. Maybe he didn't eat dinner. Maybe he didn't eat breakfast. Maybe he was like me and had to stay up and care for his, his drug related brother because my brother was, was born addicted to heroin. So I said, maybe he had to care for a brother who a mother couldn't take care of. I said, so this is the kid that we need to take care of. Mm. Don't suspend him, don't punish him, don't humiliate him, uplift this kid. So I go to those kids that I say, I tell the kids, I want the ones that are your worst. I want the ones that you say that are gonna end up in prison. I want the ones that are you saying that are failing in school. I want the ones that you're saying that are the worst of the worst. Those are the ones I want, because that's what they said about me. Mm. <sighs> Sammy, what made you take a chance on him? Um, I think that the most, I, I, you know, we started our, our work with this, uh, this idea of healing the hood. Uh, selfhood, uh, childhood, parenthood, and neighborhoods. That the diagnosis had been wrong. And the treatment, treatment plan for our community would never work if the diagnosis was wrong. As we know, a proper diagnosis is half the cure. And other folks had uh, um, created this plan of keeping us safe that really caused way more harm and destabilized uh, families for generations and still to this day continues to adversely affect our families. Um, I think that people like Raymond, uh, Raymond's a brother to me now, um, the, the minute he came in and professed to me, um, I wanna do something, I had, I, I'm obligated to bring him on board, to mentor him, to bring him uh, all the resources, expose him to all this kind of uh, 
training and leadership development because yeah. I know that it's through his own experience and his own trauma that he could bring he could bring the the healing uh, and turn that trauma into triumph and mm -hmm. turn that pain sure. into power and so uh, Raymond is one of the most effective um, you know one of the most effective movement builders we got because we're not just a nonprofit we're a, we're a movement well, in well let County. me tell you why I asked the question it's obvious that I hear your passion mm -hmm. for what it is that you do Thank you. and the strong testimony that you bring but you know, while you are the chief executive yes. uh, uh, for your agency, right. you are also an employer. Yes. And you know, one of the challenges is, is that there are a lot of men who might want to have a more active role in life right. of their children, but they can't even gain employment. No, they can't. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so, there's thousands and so of while, while, while you have singularly done something special in giving Raymond a chance, I dare say that if you weren't available, Raymond, it might be tough for you out on no, the street no to find a job. No doubt. Statistically, uh, it, the way the system is set up, is, it's set up to, to, for failure for us. Uh, although statistically, lifers that are being paroled have less than a 1% <coughs> recidivism rate when the rest of the population is at a 75%. So why not put things out there for lifers that are coming home? And when I say lifers, I mean those who uh, have been in prison for 20, 25, 30, 35, 40 years. Because Fathers and Families is one of the only organizations in San Joaquin County that has three lifers that we have on our food board. This man has done a great, has done great giving me and other lifers opportunities when we're the most passionate and most caring and understanding people because we've been there. All we want to do is give back now. Let me, let me ask you a question. Raymond, for the people that are joining us mm -hmm. in this conversation, mm -hmm. that aren't with us at this moment though, mm -hmm. what is it that they need to know about you and the people that you represent that aren't at the table tonight, mm -hmm. that they don't? What they don't understand is that we were kids who grew up in traumatic environments and hurt people hurt people. I was hurt. I was victimized many times in my life growing up through the system, in the community, in, in the neighborhoods, and all I needed was suffering and pain and hurt. So I inflicted that upon other people. When I got healing and when I got treatment, I had to seek treatment. I had to go and spend many years talking to psychologists and counselors and therapists to figure out what was wrong with me. What did you learn about yourself? I, I learned that I was a, a person who had many qualities and I was very passionate, very caring, very understanding, and who wanted to make a difference, but I just didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to direct it in the right way. So a lot of these kids that are out here in the world right now, they have so much passion, but they don't know how to, to direct their passion into a positive area. So what I say is that there's a lot of people that are incarcerated. A lot of people in my same situation that have life sentences, but they were also victimized in their life. So there are people that are in prison that are waiting for an opportunity to come out to meet somebody like Sammy Nunez to give them an opportunity to be effective in the neighborhood. Because yes, we did commit a crime and yes, some of us do need to be punished and we do serve uh, our time and have paid our debt to society. Once you have rehabilitated yourself through education, vocation, self-help and therapy, then that's an individual who's ready to come home and create healing in the hood. How big is this problem Oh, well, this is. This is an epidemic. This is a, this is the greatest social injustice of our time, uh, and it's led to with the all the social. Of, what makes you say that? Because the facts speak for themselves, and the collateral consequences. You just started mentioning that there's thousands of collateral consequences and barriers for people to stabilize after incarceration. That felony on your. Uh, and, and it's a truly unjust system. I mean, true justice is you make a mistake, you pay for it, and you move on with your life. Uh, true injustice, you make a mistake and you got to pay for it over and over and over again. And that's exactly what the system has created. Um, and if you don't believe me, a superior court, a very conservative superior court at that, uh, uh, you know, ruled against the CDCR uh, before it was CDCR because of the recidivism rate and the constant, this almost like revolving door. Um, and I think that for us, the reason why Raymond and Calvin and others that we hire, we, we hire in a, in a mixed way, academic, uh, 
really, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, rigorous like academics that come in as well as people with lived experience because we believe that blend of medicine is a powerful mm -hmm. movement. So what are the services that you guys provide? So, 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 the, so the first thing is that, that we have a concept. Our, our, our work is grounded in a certain philosophy and uh, uh, that it takes the hood to heal the hood. It takes people from the neighborhood to heal that neighborhood. So in other, in other words, yeah. a, 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 a army of Harvard PhDs parachuting into a low-income community is not going to do it. Of course not. No, of course not. It's not going to do it. No, you smile. Oh, I, I, the reason I, because that's happened, right? Well, the reason, I smile, uh, the reason mm -hmm. that I bring it up is because there's always an assumption that you can bring people in and if they've just got the right three-letter credentials by, behind their names. It's that, that lived experience. It, it's lived experience. I tell people like this. I say, you got uh, psychologists and therapists and people going to college to learn the life that I lived. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're trying to understand uh, uh, the criminal lifestyle that I lived. You're trying to understand the emotional and traumatic experiences that I lived. I lived this. You have to read it and write it and watch it. I lived it. I, I, I felt this pain. I know the suffering. You can't tell me that, that uh, uh, I don't hurt. You can't tell me that I, I haven't gone through this or I've gone through this. But people uh, are PhD. They they're go to school and they read books for this. And then you go to a kid who's black and brown, because that's who, who mostly is affected. You go to the neighborhoods of people of color and you try to put a white person there and say, can this kid relate? That kid is not gonna re relate to that individual. No matter he's, how. He's better gonna relate to me, somebody who looks like him, talks to him, has credibility, and who knows the people from the neighborhood. You see me walking around different high schools. You see me walking around different uh, uh, junior high schools. You see me walking around the neighborhood. And I go out there and I'll reach these kids and I'll help people in my community. I will help people uh, uh, with their things in, in the house, the things in the, in the area. I go to community centers, not just our community center, I go to parks. Uh, we, we go out there and set barbecues to the hood. We go out there and say, hey, we're going to have a barbecue right here in the neighborhood. Bring your homeboys, bring your family, bring your cousins. And we embrace them, people. We, we understand. Is your, is your father around today? My father is around today. He still suffers from addiction, but he's got the better hand of it. And, and my father has been do you raised. Do you guys interact? Strange thing about it, when I came home, I was living with my father. Uh, when they released me, here's the thing about, about, about me as an individual. When they released me, I didn't even know I was coming home. They told me that I would spend the rest of my life in the penitentiary, that I would die in prison. So I didn't believe that I would come home. One day they told me, you're going to go home because laws have changed. Mm -hmm. Because of SB 260 and organizations like Fathers and Families have fought for bills and initiatives to go up to release people like me. So when I was released, I came home to my father. And my father never spent time with me. We never talked. We had to repair our relationship the day I got home. And when I got home, I talked to my father. And coincidentally, my father was raised the same way I was raised. Mm -hmm. He was in and out of foster care since he was at, at the age of five. So it's the cycle the continuing. Cycle, the cycle it's of a addiction. It's yeah. a generational thing that has been going on for years. And I says, God to put me on this earth to make a difference. I'm going to be the example to make a difference. I'm going to reclaim my hood and let my story be told because how many times is this going on? It's going on right now. So, so you know, when, when you start looking at this, and, and I think I don't want to, I don't want to uh, also walk away without highlighting the fact that we have a trauma recovery center um, that is dealing with victims of gun and uh, gun violence predominantly. We're one of seven in the state. Um, and, and I can only, and I think we can uh, definitely take from our own experiences and learn from those experiences, right? As somebody who was a gun violence victim, uh, when I was discharged without any kind of like discharge care, they, they, they treated the, the, the tissue but not the trauma. And I'm going back into that same neighborhood where the conditions are entrenched, right? Where the despair is like, like just real there. Um, and so we developed this program, this agency, this movement with those kinds of gaps in mind. So we have our, we well, have psychologists and psychiatrists. We have, uh, we're working and, and guess what? Young, young people, young men, uh, because at first it was like, do they even want therapy? They're actually seeking it out. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the gaps, sure. okay? If you were sitting down right now, yeah. and let's make Raymond the governor, okay? Yeah. And I'm the director of the Department of Finance that disperses all the money. Mm. Or, or the head of the legislature, right? Mm -hmm. the, the speaker of the assembly. Right. What do they need to hear about what's needed in the areas that you two work in that they're not paying attention to right I now? I think, and I think they are starting to pay attention a little bit more, frankly, uh, in, in those halls of power. Uh, divestment from, uh, 
divestment from uh, oppressive systems that do more harm than than. than What's than an oppressive good. system? I think the prison system is an oppressive system. Sure. It's a perfect example. The Department of Juvenile Justice, um, I think, incarcerating our young people that have this unresolved trauma and pain uh, is oppressive. Uh, it is. Uh, it's really um, we don't pun we don't punish people who break the law. No, I think that there is a, a I think there is a place for um, uh, I don't I don't I don't think in a punitive system um, is actually the answer. No, I I, I think that uh, a more rehabilitative restorative approach right. is the answer. Do to we this. do rehabilitation in California? Yeah, we do. A community. No, I'm talking about it. within the system no. that we pay for as taxpayers. Um, I think that you know the data. We have a, a, a program, a reentry program. Our recidivism rate is the lowest; it's been the lowest for the last three years. So our mm -hmm. system works much better than their Maybe system. Our and recidivism rate, and we have the highest placement in employment because we care. There's a sense and of we're urgency. Have to, and we're going to have to leave it mm -hmm. right there, gentlemen. Yes. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests, and thanks to you for tuning in to Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.